Love, love, love them babies. Y'all take them home with you, though. Don't leave them. Y'all hear me? We love them, but y'all take them home. All right. Everybody, look in your Bibles right here. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to pick up in verse 24. But here's what I want to do before we start reading. I want to get you caught up to what's going on right here in this story. Now, uh, just like what we did a few weeks back where we went through the book of Exodus, I have preached on this spot before. But God showed me something right here that I never saw. And uh, I hope to show y'all that this morning. But uh, Jacob, um, y'all all remember Jacob. Jacob uh, had a brother named Esau. They were twins. And Esau come out before Jacob. But as he was coming out, Jacob reached out of the womb and grabbed Esau by the heel. Almost signifying, come back, I was supposed to be first. Because in this time, the firstborn received the blessing of the father. All right, So it was just customary. Well, in the womb, it was from the womb, and this is per the Bible. As Esau comes out, Jacob reaches out and grabs Esau, his brother, by the ankle. Well, as they grow older... Esau becomes a manly man, a hunter, a a burly man. He was red-headed and he loved to hunt and all. And and Jacob, on the other hand, he liked to farm and and tend around the house. Uh, He was kind of more like mama's boy versus Esau was more like daddy's boy. And I'm not knocking either way. They were both um, no issues there. It was just that Jacob always was somewhat East. uh, Um, jealous of Esau's birthright. Even to the point one day Esau comes walking up. He's been out hunting for hours and maybe even days at this point and he's tired and he's hungry and he's kind of got the old Baptist, oh, I'm starving to death attitude. And he comes running up and he says, oh, Jacob. And Jacob's over there and he's making this big old pot of stew or soup or something. And he said, oh, Jacob, please let give your brother a bowl of soup that I don't die of this starvation. And Jacob says, I'll give you some of this if you will sell me, give me your birthright. Trade your birthright for this food. Well, he did. Esau says, oh, what good is this birthright anyway if I die right here? So he trades his birthright to Jacob at this point. Well, he didn't exactly mean it because later on, Jacob goes in and his father has become nearly blind at this point, Isaac. And so Jacob gets his mama to put a sheep's wool all over him so he will feel like his brother, burly and very hairy. And he goes in there talking to his father to receive the birthright. And Isaac says, you don't sound like Esau, you sound like Jacob. He says, but let me feel you. And he felt that hair that his mother had helped him put all over his body. And he says, but you feel like Esau. And he says, so I bless you and I bless you. Well, about this time, Esau realizes what's happened. But it's too late. Jacob has received the blessing. And Esau wants to kill his brother. And at this point, a feud between Jacob and Esau has been birthed. And Jacob fears for his life so much that he leaves. And for years and years and years, Jacob is gone. The better part of 20 years, if not longer, Jacob is gone. And he is out and he is now getting married and he's having kids and God is blessing him. But remember from birth he has somewhat been a crook. And even to the point that Laban, his father-in-law, thinks that Jacob is now stealing from him. Because Jacob's flocks are multiplying like crazy and he's thinking that Jacob is stealing from him. But God comes to Jacob and he says, Jacob, I want you to leave. It's time for you to go back home. And Jacob has many possessions at this time. He has two wives, Leah 
And Rachel, he has 12 kids, really 13 because he has a daughter too. He has 13 kids. He has um, many sheep and cattle and oxen and all the things that make you rich in this time. And he's getting ready to leave and he don't exactly tell his father-in-law and he gets mad at him. And as the first half of chapter 32 kind of closes, Jacob and Laban make somewhat of a covenant. That Jacob would never lie to him again. He would never try to deceive him again. He would never try to come back and do some tricky things again. He will never do that. But now Jacob is headed home to see a brother that the last time he saw him, he wanted to kill him. The last time he was home, his brother, uh, the last time he saw his brother, his brother had just had his birthright stolen by his other brother, Jacob. And he remembers the anger of his brother. And as he gets ready to head home, he sends out some messengers to kind of fill out how his brother is some 20 years later. And the messengers come back and say, your brother has 400 mighty men and he's coming to meet us. And Jacob is just tore out of frame. He is scared to death for his life. And then here's what he does. He takes his possessions and he splits them up. He takes his wives. He puts his wives on one side and another wife on the other side and layers his possessions saying that hopefully I will send this group first and that when Esau starts seeing all the things coming, he will have pity. But if he don't, by the time it gets to the back, maybe the other group will realize what's happened and he won't kill all of us or take all of us. But I'm going to hang in the very back, needless to say. Do you see what kind of man he is? He is a coward. He is a thief. He is a liar and he has been since birth. And now he is getting ready to face his brother and he puts everything out in front of him to protect him, to protect self. Would you agree with me? It sounds like Jacob is very selfish on top of all of the other things. Well, Jacob is in this predicament, but God has told him to go home. He can't and he don't want to go backwards because that means going home to the in-laws or the outlaws, however you want to look at it. And he sure don't want to go forward because he don't know if his brother's going to take him and he's probably going to want to kill him. And so Jacob is what we call in between a rock and a hard place. And so the night before he gets ready to go, he sends everybody, including his wives, across a brook. And he's there all alone. And let's read all the way down to verse 27. And then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about it. Here's what happens. Verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestling a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And he wrestled with him, And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray right now that you will take this message. And Lord, you will transform it to open our eyes, Lord, and our hearts Lord, that we will hear straight from heaven. Lord, I pray right now that you will move. Lord, that we will all see you and see your word a different way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Notice right here. the Bible, Now this don't even make good sense. There's times in the Bible where it don't make sense. Can you get amen? amen. But you still got to believe it, alright? Here's what it says. And Jacob was left alone. What does left alone mean? Nobody's there. He is alone. Okay. 
So here's, here's what I want you to see, first of all. Number one, you know that he has sent everybody, including his wives and everything, across the brook and across the way, and he is alone. So there's nobody around him or with him to talk to him. Let me tell you something right here. If you've got something ahead of you that you don't know what to do, look, going to friends and family is not the answer. You need to get alone. You need to get alone with you and that book that's in your hands. And you need to talk to God. Look, people have great intentions. People love you. People want to help you. But people are not God. Can I get an amen? amen? There ain't but one person when you are in these kind of situations and these kind of predicaments that can help you. And that's God. Jacob got alone. Now whether he meant to or whether it just happened on accident, the Bible don't say. But I know one thing, he is alone. He is probably sending everybody across so that he can cry and they don't see him cry. But let me tell you something, that's okay. Let me tell you, there's been some things in my life that made me cry, that scared me to death. I'll admit it. I don't just cry. I like to consider myself a manly man. Y'all hear me? But look, there, God gave me tear ducts for a reason. There are times in life where things hurt so bad that we cry. And it's okay. Sometimes God wants you to get broke like that. Sometimes God needs you to get to that point before He can ever talk to you. Because while you're prideful, you ain't going to listen. So like I said, whether Jacob meant to get alone or whether it just happened on accident because he was scared to death, maybe he messed up his drawers and he had to clean them up and they didn't want nobody to see it. I don't know. Scared to death. But the point is, he is alone. And notice this, it's not when everybody's there that God starts talking to him. He is alone, but notice what verse 24 goes on to say. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. Now, I thought he was alone. Do you know that when you're alone, it's when you will hear God the most and the clearest and the best? You know why that's why I told you I cling to Hebrews 13, 5. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Even when I feel alone, I'm not. Even when it looks like I'm alone, I'm not. I'm going to tell you something. During COVID, that verse really come to life. Amen. There were times where we had to isolate There were times when we couldn't see friends and family for weeks and months at a time. But we were never alone. But right here, he is alone. And his friends, his servants, his family, his kids think he's back there alone. But he is wrestling with someone. Notice what the Bible says. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him. Now hold on, i got to tell you all something right here. First of all, that's God. In the flesh. Alright, I believe it's Jesus. In the flesh. He has come in the flesh. And you know that you say, well, all right, prove that. We'll go on down just a few more verses and we're going to get to it in a minute. But he says over here, I have wrestled with God and seen God's face and I didn't die. He tells us that over there. And uh, let's see right here, verse 30. He says, I seen God's own face and I didn't even die. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a hint real quick before we go any further. He is wrestling with God. But here's the thing that just really mind-blowing a little bit. Think about this for just a second. 
He is wrestling with God until the breaking of day. Verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me God can't beat Jacob? God can't overcome Jacob? I thought God is almighty and all powerful and can do all things. He is. Well, then why can't he beat Jacob? I'm glad you asked. Throw up 2 Peter for me, Will. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want you all to look at this verse right here. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count Him slack, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing, here's the point, that any should perish, but that all, should come to repentance. Now, why isn't everybody in this world saved? That verse right there explains it. God never intended for a single person to go to hell. But He cannot and He will not force you to get saved. Here's what, where, where things get really hairy. Things get really really unique when God created us he created us with a thing called free will he created us with choice you do not have to love God if God wanted to force you to love him and force you to get saved then you wouldn't be a person and you wouldn't have a choice. You'd be a robot. But what is love if it's forced? Is it genuine? But what are the consequences of giving somebody the choice to love you? The choice to not love you. The choice to not want you. The choice to say, I don't need you. You see, here's why God could not prevail against Jacob. Because he was not going to force Jacob to do it. Jacob had to want to do it. But God is not going to force you. If you go to hell, it's because you wanted to. Jesus paid the way. God made a way. Jesus loves you so much that He died for you and paid the way for you. But He will not force you to do it. So why couldn't God prevail? Because He loved Jacob so much He let Jacob have the choice. But it don't mean Jacob chose wisely. You see, a lot of times in your life, the reason you're going through hard times is because you don't want what God offers. God loves you and God has a way planned for you. But you say, I don't want it, God. I'm good. And here's the thing. God will not force you to take it. You don't want it, so be it. You cheat yourself. You so see right here, he's wrestling with Jacob, but he can't prevail against Jacob. So what does he do? This part's really sad. I'm going to be honest with you. Notice what he done, verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. You see that right there? Jacob, he said, let me go, Jacob. And Jacob said, no, I can't let you go. Let me go. And this tussle match all night long is going on. You know, first off, I think Jacob is so excited that God showed up. You ever just wanted God to be there? And then all of a sudden, it's like you got him and like, God, please don't leave me. And I think that's where Jacob's at right now. Maybe Jacob hasn't even come to the conclusion that, 
I, I, I need you to bless me yet, although he does say that in just a minute. Maybe he's just glad God's there. But now all of a sudden, he's wrestling with God. I, and here's how I think this really went down. He's trying to talk some sense into Jacob. He's trying to show Jacob some things. And you know what it's like? You ever talk to a 14-year-old? They'll educate you. You don't educate them. I think that's what it was like right here. I think God is trying His best to talk to Jacob. But Jacob has all the answers. Jacob already knows what he needs. Jacob has everything planned out, God. I just need you to put it in order. Place my order for me. Make it happen. And God said, no, Jacob, no, 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 Jacob. That's not what you need. You see, you've been praying. And, and I hate to bring up Garth Brooks in a sermon, but he did write one song I do agree with. And y'all know what it is. Thank God for unanswered prayers. Because that 14-year-old mind thought it was what I needed. I had all the answers. I just need you to hit sin, God. I, and I hit sin and I just need you to answer, God. That's what, that's what we're sitting there saying. But you know what? God said, I love you too much. I am not accepting that. I'm going to, you're going to feel like I'm going to ruin your life, but prom, I promise you I'm not. And then you get older and you look back and you say, thank God that he loved me so much he could even say no. Do you know no is an answer to prayer too? Do you know no hurts you and them, but it's what is needed in that moment sometimes? And right here, even though Jacob thinks he knows everything he needs and God is trying to speak truth into him and he won't listen, he says, all right, fine. But I'm not, I'm not doing this with you anymore. But then Jacob says, please don't leave me, God. And you know what God had to do? Start applying the pressure. You see, you're hanging on to God with everything in your heart and in your mind. You're hanging on by the fingernails that God gave you. But you won't budge, and it is causing you pain. You know, some people in this life are saying, just let go. If God really loved you, He wouldn't leave you hanging like that. Maybe you need to look, reassess the situation and say, why am I hanging? You see, God had a plan. But Jacob thinks he knows what he needs and not what God needs. And now God is having to apply pain and pressure in your life. You know, here's the thing. There's pain and sorrow in your life because God is trying to get your attention. It's not that God's mad at you. It's not that God's upset with you. But you won't listen. So God says, I, it's killing me to have to do this, but I got to because you won't listen. But you're like, but God, even through the pain, please don't let go. You know you need him. You know you want him. But you still don't want to listen to him. You are wrestling and fighting. You know what wrestling is? I, you know, I wrestled in high school. I'll be honest, I hated it too. I'm not easily grossed out, but I ain't crazy about body fluids. Y'all hear me? And when you all up in some other dude's armpit and y'all sweats rubbing all over and everything, that is not cool. Y'all hear me? I smelt things I never want to smell again. You know? I went home and took a Clorox bath after we were done. No wonder I'm so white. But, but the point is this. You don't, it is, it is not fun. You know why? You are trying to force your will against them and they are trying to force their will against you. And it is a struggle from the very beginning. And let me tell you this. I have played football. I have played basketball. I have run cross country. I have run 5Ks. I, I have done uh, uh, soccer I've done all these sports. I, the hardest, most enduring sport I've ever done in my life is wrestling. And you do it for three minutes at a time. You get up from that wrestling mat when it's, 
win, lose, or draw, and you are exhausted. You know, a lot of y'all come walking in here every single week and you are exhausted. You are exhausted spiritually, you are exhausted mentally, you are exhausted physically, and you say, I don't know how much more I can take. Now, you may not say it to me, you may not say it outwardly, but I promise you have looked at yourself in the mirror and did it. I don't know how much longer I can do this. I don't know how much more I can take. You are wrestling with situations in your life and the whole time God is trying to get your attention. And let me tell you, the more you fight God, the more painful it's going to get. Look what happens to Jacob right here. The Bible says, and he touched Jacob, verse 25, and he touched Jacob in the hollow of his thigh, and it was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then look what he says. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he says, I will not let thee go except thee bless me. I will not turn you loose, God. I can't afford to turn you loose unless you bless me. Do you know God can move that mountain in your life? But He don't have to. God can move things and make ways. But when you get past that mountain that He just moved, are you still going to trust Him? Or are you just going to be thankful He moved that mountain? You see, it's kind of like when somebody gets caught. A lot of times they're, caught, uh, they're sorry because they got caught, not because they're really sorry. You see, God knows your heart. God knows whether or not you really are thankful and grateful and won't ever do that again. Or you're like, well, God made a way again and I ain't got to worry about it again. And He'll make another way. I'll just mess up. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. and I, I don't need no change. God will make a way. No. You see this right here? Jacob has lived a life of lying and cheating and deceit. Coward. And God is fed up with it. And now He has allowed Jacob to get himself in between a rock and a hard place. You want to know what's funny? God didn't do this to Jacob. Jacob done this to Jacob. Jacob ticked his father-in-law off. Jacob ticked his brother off. This is Jacob's problem. Can't blame God for some of your problems. So right here, God is telling Jacob, He said, Jacob, I want to bless you, but you don't want it. Keep going. He said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And here's what He says. Now, now y'all, this is so good. Listen to what He says in verse 27. If you ain't got verse 27 highlighted, you, you highlight it right now, I'm telling you. Here's what He says. And He said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, well, that's weird. But listen to it. And he said, what is thy name? God is asking you right now, what is your name? Let me reword it. Who are you? What does the world think about you? What does your kids think about you? What does your spouse think about you? What does your co-workers think about you? Who are you? Who are you? Do you know you can't just say Jonathan Pike? When you say Jonathan Pike, you say Pastor of Woodland Baptist Church. You say husband of Amy Pike, father of Emma, Ian, and Evie Pike. You say, born and raised in Hogesville, Georgia, son of Dennis and Gina Pike, has two brothers, Adam and Jeremy Pike. You see, I am somebody and I have association to my name. Who am I? Who are you? What does your name mean 
to the people you come in contact with every day. When your name is brought up in a conversation, what do people say about you? What do people think about you? So God right here is asking Jacob, what is your name? And here's Jacob's response. Oh, he says my name is Jacob, but here's what he really said. He says, what is your name, Jacob? And at this point, after all the fighting and all the wrestling and all the, the tussling all night long, Jacob finally breaks down and here's what he says. I am Jacob. I am liar. I am deceiver. I am heel grabber. I am coward. I am prideful. I am Jacob. I'm a wretched sinner. I'm nobody. You know what? Maybe you do need to go. I'm not worth saving. I'm not worth blessing. I'm not worth loving. Maybe you do need to go. God, I'm so sorry for keeping you here all this time. You know what, God? I'm nobody. You see what just happened? You can't admit who you are. And therefore, God can't bless you. You know that 1 John tells us, chapter 1, that if we will confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive them. But you know what you got a problem with? Oh, that wasn't me. Oh, I didn't do that. You know, my dad told me one time, this was way back 20, 30 years ago, cameras back then used to be about that long and about that big around. You know, y'all remember, you could spot them from a mile away. And they, they started putting them up, security cameras everywhere, I remember. And there was one time on the school bus, they even started putting them on the school bus, on the school bus where some of us got in trouble. And I said, Daddy, it wasn't me. And you know what they did? They pulled that video. And you know what my dad said? The big eye don't lie. And I've never forgot that. So for you to sit right there and tell God, it wasn't me. God, I wasn't there. It wasn't me. God, I didn't really do that. I really was trying to, yeah, I was trying to do this. God said, the big eye don't lie. I know exactly what you did. Matter of fact, I know your heart and your intentions before you did it. You're not fooling me. But you know what? We have a problem right here saying who we are, what we've done, confessing who we are. You see, a lot of people, this is their mentality. If people know who I am, they'll judge me. If you don't confess what you've done before Almighty God, He'll judge you. And then He'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So you can either get judged by man or you can get judged by God. But I promise you, God will bless you. But right here, Jacob had to make up his mind. Do I really want to admit who I am? Do I really want to admit what I've done? Doing. And finally he does. And now let's look at what happened as we close out this story. Verse 28. And he said, Thy name shall call, be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Y'all see, that's so good. I, get, I come back. Look. For as a prince... Hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed? And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is that that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called 
the name of the place, Penel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. You see that right there? But read this next verse too, though. And as he passed over Penel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So here's what just happened. He says, because you will confess and admit who you are and what you've done, guess what? There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. You know what? The day I said, Jesus, I am wretched. I've done this and this and this. And you know it. Lord God, please forgive me. Please come into my heart and save my soul. I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. You know what he did? He broke out that heavenly pen. And I believe it's golden ink, y'all. And it said, Jonathan Pike, brand new. Amen. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Jacob right here, he said, no more will you be called liar, cheater, deceiver, coward, wuss, whatever you want to call it, sissy, whatever, thief, whatever. No more. You know what you're going to be called? Israel. From now on, they will remember you as Israel. Do you know to this day we call the children of Israel? Israel. His name is glorified now. You see that? You see what happens when you come in encounter with God Almighty and you quit fighting Him and you quit wrestling Him? You know what happens just about every Sunday morning? A lot of y'all, whether it's because of salvation purposes or prayer purposes, there are claw marks in the back of these pews. You are wrestling with these pews because, oh, somebody might see me. Well, you walked in with them problems. You finna walk out with them problems because you won't give them to God. Because you worried somebody's going to see you. Keep wrestling with that pew and keep wrestling with God and see what's going to happen. You're going to keep living a miserable life. But I promise you, you're going to keep begging, God, please don't leave me. God, please help me. God, please move in my life. And God says, I want to, but I will not force you. And he says, I will give you a new life. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put you on a new trajectory in life. I'm going to give you a new destiny. You ain't going to be Jacob no more. You ain't going to be trouble no more. You ain't going to be liar no more and thief no more. You will be Israel. And then as Jacob got up, you know what he did? Oh, I love this too. You just think the story ended right there. No, look what happened. He got up and he went to walk in. Oh, oh. Not because he just rolled out of bed like some of y'all this morning. You hear me? You know what happened? He touched me. Oh, he touched me. For the rest of his life, everybody said, Jacob, what happened to you? Oh, he touched me. That's where that song really come from. Y'all just didn't know it. God Almighty, when you come in contact with God and you surrender your life, you never walk the same. Woo, is that not good? You will never walk the same. For the rest of your life, people will look at you and they say, you look the same. You, you, I, that's you, but there's something different. Why? What happened? Oh, he touched me. Oh, he changed my life. And it has been the greatest thing I've ever done. Surrendering to Almighty God. Y'all, I'm going to tell you, when I read this story, and I, I, even when I preached it way back when, this story, I don't care how many times you preach it, it's good. It's one of them you can read over and over and over and over, and you're like, that's good. But there's one gripe to me in the Bible, and, and I'm not even griping, but if, if I could throw in a gripe right here, 
It's because you notice there's one more verse and that chapter ends. And we will and would have missed what I think is one of the also greatest parts of this story. You see, God and Jacob had a wrestling match. And Jacob finally surrendered. And he gave him a new name written down in glory. He gave him a new life. And he changed the way he walked for the rest of his life. But what about Esau? Everybody look at chapter 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau came and with him 400 men. And he divided the children of Leah and unto Rachel and unto his two handmaids. And he put handmaids and children foremost and Leah and his children after Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Verse 4. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Do you know what happens when God comes into your life? He puts families back together. He puts brothers and sisters back together. He puts brothers back together. He puts mamas and daddies and kids back together. What this world and what sin tries to tear us apart, God's love puts us back together. If you've ever had somebody in your family that broke your heart, you know what I'm talking about. They loved you and you loved them, but some stupid in this world come along and tore y'all apart. And I'm telling you, you have tried everything and nothing could fix it but God. What happens when we surrender our lives? God puts us all back together. God takes us And he wraps us all back up to one big happy family that we are. He puts differences aside. He puts pain aside. He puts words aside. You say sticks and stones and break my bones, but words never hurt me. That's the biggest lie from hell that ever came. He puts words aside. He puts differences aside. And he pulls us back together. He saw it and said, why did you deceive me, brother? Why did you do that to me, brother? He didn't do that. He said, there's my brother. And I love him. And he's gone. What happens when we give our life to God? He puts the most precious things back in our lives. And He blesses us for the rest of our lives. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I've preached that story over and over and I missed that part. But praise God, I found it today. (laughs) Amen. There is nothing like being put back together with the people you love. There's nothing like having your friends and your family that look past all those differences and just grab you and they kiss you and they hug you and they love you. There's nothing like it. But that's what God does. This world will keep you apart for all eternity. But God will put you back together. God will restore lives and souls. 
Every head bowed, every eye closed. Y'all, I'm going to do something different this morning. I'm going to ask everyone to go ahead and stand. And I want you, right where you stand today, to let go of that pew. And you come get one-on-one with God. Whatever you walked in here with, leave it right here. Quit wrestling with God. Quit wrestling with things that you can't control and that you can't fix. Remember, the more Jacob tried to fix his problems, the worse they got. So I want to tell you right now, quit fighting God. And give it to him this morning. You hear me? As Emma starts singing, this altar is open. You come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved her. opportunity that if you don't know Jesus Christ today you will have that opportunity so right where you stand right there right where you are listen to me if you don't know that you know that you know that if today was your last day on earth our Sunday school lesson this morning 
John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You cannot go to heaven without Jesus Christ. So right where you stand today, will you give your life to Him? Will you trust Jesus? You pray this prayer with me. You mean it with all your heart, just like I did. And I promise you will be saved. Heavenly Father, Lord, I realize I am a sinner. And Lord, I believe you died on that cross for me. Lord, I'm asking you right now to please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save my soul. Praise God. Nobody looking around. If you pray that prayer, would you lift your hand? Lift it up high. Amen. I see him. Y'all, let me tell you something. I'm going to let Emma do one more verse. Don't you hang on to that pew this morning. You hear me? If God is dealing with you, if God has been dealing with you, give it to God. He says no matter how great, how small... You give it to God. Let God bless your life. Let God restore your life. But look, I'm not going to come out there and grab you by the hand and drag you down here. And neither is God or the Holy Spirit. You have to be willing to give in. You have to be willing to let go this morning. So before she sees this verse, listen. It's your choice. It's your moment. But when she gets done singing, if nobody's down here, we're going to close this service. But if God is working on you right where you are today, I don't care if it's one person, we'll wait. You hear me? You are worth it. Don't fight. Sing it, Emma. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbid to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever. people say amen, amen. love y'all thank y'all all so much for being here this morning look if you're going on the ark and you need uh you got questions comments concerns uh right down here donna is that good right down front me or miss donna will be down here <coughs> excuse me uh amy says she's got sign up sheets in the back back there for anybody that wants to get signed up for our easter outreach and please don't forget while you're doing your grocery orders please grab an extra thing of eggs on the plastic eggs and pack them with candy amen them babies will love you forever i'll tell them it was from you whether it does or not you hear me but anyway i love y'all thank y'all all so much for being here this morning mike spooner you'll close us in prayer my brother